Some might wonder what the greatest event in the history of the world is, what the greatest accomplishment of mankind, what thing will be remembered for all time. Some may say it was when we figured out fire, or we figured out the wheel, but for Christians, the greatest moment in the world is when the light of Jesus Christ came into the world. You can debate whether Christmas or Easter is a greater holiday. One, Jesus was born, the other, Jesus died. But when Jesus came into this world, when Jesus lived a perfect life, when Jesus died for our sins, the life, the person of Jesus Christ, is the greatest thing that ever happened in this world. In the book of John, Jesus is called the light. And there are many applications to what it means for Jesus Christ to be the light. In past weeks, we talked about spiritual understanding. We talked about seeing the difference between right and wrong and good and evil. Today, another application would be that Jesus Christ illuminates our path in life. You want to know where you're going? Jesus Christ can tell you that. You want to know what's happening? Jesus Christ can tell you that. You want to know the purpose, meaning of why you're here? Jesus Christ can tell you that. This is not a new concept. Way back in Psalm 119, David wrote, Your word is a lamp to my feet and a light unto my path. One little interesting thing is that David writes about a light to the path and he says, your word, and John 1.1 1, 1 says that Jesus Christ is the word of God. So was David talking about Jesus Christ? I don't know. Back then it was the Old Testament which would light your path. Today it's Jesus Christ and the Holy Spirit that is within us. What does it mean to have your path lit? Many weeks ago, I was at a Bible study in San Jose at a friend's house, and it got over about 8 o'clock, and it was dark. And so I opened the door to leave. We had said our goodbyes. Right when I opened the door, power went out, as it will in San Jose. And even though I had been in that house dozens of times, I knew that the porch had steps. I hadn't necessarily measured the distance to the next step. And it was pitch black. It was pitch black for two reasons. One, I had been in a very lit room and now it was very dark. Apparently it was very cloudy also, so there was no moon out there. It was dark. And so I, you know, as I reasoned through, what am I going to do? Am I going to try to figure out? And then about this point in time, the people behind me that were getting impatient started to push. But I had no light. I didn't know where I was going. So I kind of inched out a little bit. And after what seemed like an hour, it was actually maybe 45 seconds, somebody came out with a really big, bright flashlight. And they shined the flashlight, and I noticed that I had gotten kind of sideways on the step. And if I had taken one more step, it would have been two and a half feet down onto the gravel that was next to the house and the sprinkler stuff that they had there. I mean, at least it would have hurt. <laughs> Probably wouldn't have died, but it would have hurt. But it would have given them a chance to care for me some. <laughs> we in life are going along just fine. We know exactly what we're doing. We've been in this situation dozens of times before. And then life will throw a wrench in it and the lights will go out. And we'll have no idea what the right way to go is or the wrong way to go is. We have no idea what's better for us, what's safe, what's going to keep us from being hurt. And if we happen to get the light of Jesus in our lives and He begins to open our eyes, we will see that we are inches away from a cliff or a bad situation or getting really hurt spiritually or physically. And the idea is to get Jesus Christ and His light as a path of our life early enough that we make the proper decisions along the way so we don't get in crisis mode. 
It's very easy to get confused and lost when we don't have light in the physical world. It's very easy to get confused and lost when we don't have direction, purpose, meaning, and light in the spiritual world. John makes the case that Jesus is the only true and genuine light. There are many, many, many false lights that are out there. There are many people who will say, go this direction or that direction, that they happen to know the light. But Jesus Christ is the only true, only accurate, only light that we need in our lives. John then says that the light, Jesus, is available to everyone. Anybody who wants the light, anybody who needs the light, anybody who accepts that Jesus is the light can have the light, but many will reject the light. Who rejects the light? Well, first, everybody. It says Jesus was in the world, Jesus created the world, and the world rejected him. The world says, I don't want your light. That's an interesting concept. God creates the world and the world rejects him. It's like somebody making a, a piece of pottery or making a painting, and then the painting coming to life and saying, you didn't make me, I made myself. And the, the pot, pottery getting legs and running away, saying, I wasn't created, I, I made myself. It's the same sort of thing that Jesus, through the power of God, made you and I, and yet we reject him. And the second group is the Jews, and that is important because Jesus Christ was born a Jew. Jesus Christ was born to the Jewish people, and yet his own people that he was born of, the subset of the world, did not accept him. And so if you accept Jesus Christ, if you want the light, you are going to be in a minority, according to the Word of God. You are going to be in a group that is not widely accepted. And as time goes on, as we get closer and closer to the return of Jesus Christ, the minority status of Christians is going to be greatly increased as the world begins to reject Him more and more. Now, I don't often recommend movies. In fact, I don't think I've ever recommended a movie. Uh, but there's a movie coming out March 21, and it's called God's Not Dead. And it's a fascinating story. Uh, I've only seen the trailers and read the early reviews. But it's about a college kid who goes to some college class, and the professor makes everybody write on a piece of paper, God is dead, and what they're going to do about it. And this kid is a Christian in college, away from home, away from the church he grew up in, says he can't do it. And the whole rest of the movie is the conflict between this college student and the professor, and ultimately the college, of can a college demand you to believe a certain way or not with, re with regard to God. And I would recommend that you see it for two reasons. One, it is the state of the world today. And second, it happened to me. It happened to me many years ago. I was at Chabot College, right down the road. I was in a biology class, and the person started by saying, to be in this biology class, you must all affirm that evolution is true. And I said I couldn't do it. And through being sent to the dean's office and talking with the dean, they actually determined he couldn't make me say that. So I was able to go to the biology class and get a good grade. But there are people who do not believe in God in our schools and in our government, and they are trying to tell you and I and our kids that God is dead. And because you have the true light, because you know who Jesus Christ is, because you have a truth that they do not, then you get to put that little not sign up there and say, no, 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 God's not dead. I happen to know what's going on. The conclusion of all this is what do you get? You say, okay, well, I accept Jesus Christ. I have the light. I have the purpose. John says that you become a child of God. You become God's children. We are not God's children in the way that we are junior gods. But we are adopted into God's family with all of the benefits and all of the blessings that come with it. John 
classifies this by saying, it's not of human or natural birth. It says not of blood. Uh, that is talking about human blood. When you have a baby, it is bloody. And that is not the type of blood that is involved. Uh, Nicodemus had a problem with this. Jesus is talking with Nicodemus in John 3. We'll get to that a couple months from now. And Nicodemus says, what? I need to re-enter my mother's womb. And Jesus says, no, you need to be born of the Spirit. You need to be reborn of God. And this is why we say that Christians are born again. I saw somebody on TV ask another person, are you a born-again Christian? And they tried to say, well, there's no other kind. I can't be a Christian and not be born again. I can't be born again and not be a Christian. The whole concept is that when we accept Jesus Christ, our spirit, our innards, get born again through the Spirit of God, not of natural birth and not of human determination or reason. If you want your second million, I have an opportunity for you. Uh, Google, the great search engine, has announced last Thursday that they will give $1 million to the next person who walks on the moon. They will give $5 million to the next person who takes some sort of vehicle up there and drives it 500 yards. And then there's a big prize of $50 million if they live up there for a certain amount of time. But if you want your next million, uh, go walk on the moon and Google will write you a check. How will people do this? Because I believe when that much money is at stake, people are going to do it. Well, there are people all over the world who are sitting down and trying to figure it out through human reason, through force of will. And there will be some over-the-top, overachiever guy who will figure it out how to do it cheaply. And will send a rocket up there and somebody will walk on the moon and it will be on the news and Google will hand them a check. Because human determination, force of will, can accomplish a great deal. Everything you see that's built out there, all the technology, all the roads, all the bridges were built by human ingenuity because when it comes right down to it, we're pretty smart. We invent a lot of things. There's, there's millions of patents. There's new things coming out all the time, all by human determination. But if somebody says, I want to get to heaven, what God's saying is, your ingenuity can get you to the moon, but your ingenuity can't get you to heaven. We can't figure out how to do it. I can't build something to take me there. I can't, through the absolute force of my will and dogged determination, make it to heaven. I can only make it to heaven through the blood of Jesus Christ and accepting that truth and applying it to my life. I bring nothing to the table to enhance my salvation. I bring nothing to God where God looks at me and says, wow, that's pretty neat. I bring nothing to the table where God looks at what I have and says, wow, that'll bring you three quarters of the way there. Nothing I have will impress God, will get God's attention, will make Him say, wow. Or will even make him take notice. The only thing that I can do to get into heaven and to get part of God's family is to accept Jesus Christ as my personal Lord and Savior. We become part of the family of God through the will of the power and the light of God. I bring nothing to it. I can't earn it. It is 100% Jesus Christ. And if you don't have Jesus Christ, you are standing on a porch and it's pitch black. And you don't know if you go to the right if it's right, if you go to the left if it's good, if you go straight ahead if it's good, you don't know which way to go. But on that porch is a light. And that light is Jesus Christ. And if you have Jesus Christ, you will know the next step, and the next step, 
and the next step for the rest of your life. He may not show you ten steps ahead, but he'll show you one, and he'll show you two, and every step of the way, the light is there to illuminate. Craig Barnes, the pastor of the National Presbyterian Church in Washington, D.C., tells this story. When I was a child, my minister father brought home a 12-year-old boy named Roger, whose parents had died from a drug overdose. There was no one to care for Roger, so my folks decided that they'd just raise him as if he were one of their sons. At first, it was quite difficult for Roger to adjust to his new home, an environment free of heroin and addicted adults. Every day, several times a day, I heard my parents saying to Roger, no, no, that's not how we behave in this family. No, no, you don't have to scream or fight or hurt other people to get what you want. No, no, Roger, we expect you to show respect in this family. And in time, Roger began to change. Now, did Roger have to make all those changes in order to become part of the family? No. He was made part of the family simply by the grace of the Father. But did he then have to do a lot of hard work because he was part of the family? Yes, he did. It was tough for him to change, and he had to work at it. But he was motivated by gratitude for the incredible love he had received. You have a lot of hard work being part of God's family. Doing that work does not mean that God will love you more or that God will love you less. If you are a son or daughter of the Heavenly Father, can you impress Him with your work? No, but you make those changes because you are a son or a daughter. And every time you start to revert back to the old addictions of sin, the Holy Spirit will say to you simply, No, no, that's not how we act in this family. Let us pray. Lord God Almighty, I praise you that you have created a way that we can be adopted into your family. And even though the world is out of control and the world rejects you, we can be part of your family. We can have blessings, we can have love, and we can have light, knowing that the next step, we can know whether it is good or bad, we can know whether it is towards you or away from you, because you have given us the light of Jesus Christ. Lord, I pray that you will continue to light our path every step of the way, that you will continue to guide us every step of the way, that you will give us purpose, that you will give us meaning. Lord, we just love you so much, and we ask for your continued blessing. And teach us how to act in the family of God. Lord, we praise you for that, and ask your blessing upon the remainder of the day. And we ask this through the blood of Christ by which we are adopted. We ask this in your name. Amen.